So this is the kinetic energy, this is the potential energy, and you know, for we saw it as uh, with epsilon, so it is this. So pi over here, capital pi, is a measure of uh, the thermal energy. So you know, this is going back to like uh, our first week. This P, the pressure. So, where does the, the pressure come from? What is creating that pressure? No idea? Well, the as you increase the kinetic energy of the molecules, they start hitting each other more often uh, with more force, and so that increases the pressure. And we're assuming that this is a, a gas, a dilute gas with a gas. And so the potential energy pi. Now this one is rho. Remember there's a difference between rho and p, the pressure. Rho is the density. The mass and that's it. This is contained, uh, well, just for a single body, right? Yes. Okay. So, you know, the trick that we're going to use um, even though you have this continuum of interstellar medium, we can select, you know, a region and say, oh, you know, this part is going to look kind of like a, like a star. It's going to be some, doesn't have to be spherical, but some region. Um, this of course is for the uh, spherical symmetry. Uh, the other one that we know very well is the mass. Right? It's a function of the radius. So that's it's just the that one. Okay, so these equations we know them. We have worked with them and everything. So the virial theorem is going to provide us with a boundary. So this is your interstellar medium and you have your particles in there. If capital P, I mean uh, pi, is greater than negative the potential energy, what will happen? Well, there's more kinetic energy than required to bound these this body of matter, so it will expand, right? It has more, more pressure, um, more kinetic energy, which can produce more pressure. You mean the magnitude, right? Um, I think at this point it doesn't matter, but yeah, you can consider the magnitude, it will also be true. So, well, kinetic energy then can be more negative than negative potential energy, right? That's so it's not the magnitude. 
So, yeah, this is your your potential well, right? Yeah. And this is how much kinetic energy you have. So if you have more kinetic energy than the potential well, then it will expand. If it has less, then it will start contracting. Right? Mm -hmm. So if it's exactly zero, it's in equilibrium. Yeah, okay. So you, know, you can start looking at regions of this space and see if the kinetic energy uh, produced by, um, sorry, the pressure produced by the kinetic energy is greater than uh, the binding gravitational energy. So the interstellar medium is not homogeneous. You know, you're going to have some regions that have uh, higher density or lower density. They're not spherical necessarily. You know, they're just like kind of extend through space. So what we're going to do to deal with this is to consider an average density, right? Instead of a density that is a function of of the position. So if that is the case, we can simplify the equations that we wrote at the beginning. So if you have your average density, then the mass is going to be But now rho is a constant, you know, for pi is a constant. So the mass is just gonna be right minus omega is going to be now it's going to be plus. We had the negative before. Uh, G So again, this one, this we can take out, we just have the R dr. So this minus omega is gonna be G four pi squared over six. Average rho squared, and then r to the fifth. So this is not the negative two; it's just the average. Um, can you give me a second? Sorry about that. Got some liquor. Right. So the other relationship that we're going to use, um, I'm not going to derive it, but maybe you can derive it. 
as part of your homework. And we used it before, I think in homework six. So the pressure is going to be not equal, but in the same order of magnitude as CS squared rho. Uh, this is the uh, speed of sound. So speed of sound squared times the density. Uh, finally, I just read the plugging in you know, the average density for I mean, the integrals. We get that um, capital pi is going to be four pi, small pi, cs squared average density r cubed. So this is not an exact calculation. As I mentioned, um, the symmetry doesn't necessarily have to be spherical. So this is more uh, an order of magnitude calculation. So what we're going to use is capital pi approximately equal to four pi cs squared rho r cubed and omega, uh, negative omega, approximately equal to four pi squared g, so the gravitational constant, rho squared r to the fifth. So this is Weinberg Three point four point five. So now we're going to look at this case in which the gravitational attraction is stronger than uh, the kinetic energy, and so this will start to contract, or at least it is the, the boundary where it will start to contract. So, we just put this one in there. Should start doing this, sorry. Four pi, c squared, rho, r cube. It's gonna be less than uh, four pi. This one is a absolute value. So what we get from this one is that the speed of sound squared has to be smaller than four pi g rho r squared. So what does the speed of light tell you about, sorry, the speed of light, the speed of sound tell you about a material or you know, a gas, a fluid? Uh, 
Any ideas? How many particles are in the medium? How many particles? In a way, like if you don't have enough particles, you will probably not have sound. So you know, the speed of light, for example, is um, you know, the speed limit in the universe is the speed at which information can travel the fastest. In a material, the speed of sound tells you uh, how fast information can travel through that, through that material. So it tells you something about the, uh, the waves, right? So sound is a, is a wave, a mechanical wave. So, do you expect a gas like hydrogen to have a higher or lower speed of sound than, let's say, oxygen? I was just going to ask about that. Um, considering like molecular weight, that's probably what the speed of sound would tell you about. Maybe that's what you want us to think about. Mm. Because what you were telling, right? Like how it's how fast they move each other. Yep. So F equals MA, you can be like, oh, okay. So mass is bigger, the acceleration is smaller. Mm -hmm. So isn't the a, speed of sound. Isn't there a cool experiment like where they ingest helium and their voice goes higher? Then when they just um, sulfur or hexafluorine or something like that. Your voice goes deeper because the your lungs and your voice is like propagating through that medium that's heavier than helium is. It's a it's a very interesting uh, scenario. So you know your your voice in the atmosphere, right? So seventy six percent nitrogen, twenty four percent oxygen, give or take. So if you go to a helium atmosphere, your voice will sound pretty different. Why? Since helium is lighter than air. Uh -huh. Because the atoms are either, like you're either increasing or decreasing the frequency of those waves. Um, if you change the speed of sound, you're, you're changing the velocity at which those uh, waves propagate and that's exactly what the frequency depends on. Right, so the frequency, you're, you're exerting the same force with your lungs, right, and vocal cords, but um, because sound travels faster, the frequency is uh, it's higher, so it sounds different for sure. Um, so it tells you, you know, stuff about the material. Um, so, R squared over here, you know, if we move everything to this side, we can call this dude uh, the genes radius or the genes length, sorry, not radius. Is that the right way to spell length? It sounds better. Okay. Um, so the genes radius uh, or length is how much volume, and it's related to the volume, uh, you need to encapsulate to bound, gravitationally bound uh, some region of, you know, some, some matter in a region of space. And how big or how small that distance is depends on the speed of sound and the density. Um, G is just a constant. 
So is it easier? I shouldn't say easier, but um, is the length of space that you need to encapsulate gravitationally bound, uh, gravitationally bind um, an oxygen atmosphere, let's say O2, versus a hydrogen atmosphere? Which one is greater? Well, for oxygen, is the speed of sound going to be lower or higher than for hydrogen? I expect it to be lower. Lower. And the density? Ah, I don't remember. Which one is denser, oxygen or hydrogen? Well, it's molecule by molecule, it's oxygen. Yeah, let's assume that it's the same number density. But mass okay. density, this one is heavier, right? Yeah. So, do you need a bigger or smaller length to gravitationally bind oxygen versus hydrogen? Well, I feel like the speed of sound increases way, way faster than, or decreases way faster than the, the density factor this this one is greater for oxygen so they both in oh yeah you're right you're right okay okay directions i mean in the same direction yeah they're both making it smaller mm -hmm. so this one's smaller right mm, this, this well one. not necessarily because you don't have any quality but it can be smaller i i don't know where it's defined but you don't have any quality an equality oh i see so are, are B like an infinitely big, uh, well, it can be any number in an infinitely big set. Okay, let's look at only this term. Which one is greater? Well, wait, 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 what? Forget about the inequality. Uh-huh. Ah, oh, that term is much smaller for um, oxygen. That's why you're asking? Yes. So, you know, actually, you could have, um, so the, the hydrogen one is going to be bigger. It could, it could include the oxygen, but the oxygen cannot include the, the hydrogen. So, anyways, does that make sense that it's, that the amount of, you know, space that you need to encapsulate oxygen um, is smaller than hydrogen? I think it is, right? It's denser, moves slowly, has more you know, mass per, um, per particle. So that's the uh, gene's length. So you're going to have gravitational condensation if R is less than the gene's length. Okay, so another cool part. The speed of sound is equal to the, our friend, the adiabatic index. ABT divided by the mass per particle. So the adiabatic index was five thirds for a monoatomic ideal gas, and it is seven fifths for diatomic molecules. So this one is about 1.66, this one is about 1.4. So the speed of sound is going to decrease, not by much, but you know, a little bit, maybe 10% or so. Um, it's going to decrease 
if you have a monoatomic gas or if you have a diatomic gas. So H is monoatomic, H2 molecule is diatomic. And the adiabatic index is equal to the heat capacity, the ratio of the heat capacity is right, Cv over Cp, constant volume and a constant pressure. So we have seen all those things before. And so we know that uh, the speed of sound is going to be related, you know, not just to the properties of the material, the materials properties, but the thermodynamic properties uh, also. So I did have a few numbers. So hydrogen, H2, the speed of sound um, at like 300 Kelvin, so atmospheric uh, temperature and also atmospheric pressure is about 1,270 meters per second. The number of nucleons in the hydrogen molecule is two, right? So you have the two hydrogen atoms, so two protons. Even if they're not together, you still have the two protons. Uh, helium also has two protons, although they are together. And the speed of sound is 1,007 meters per second. So it's a little slower because um, this one is, well, this one is diatomic, this one is not. Wait, there's something. Oh, the particle, the particle mass. So here is one, sorry. Oh, the particle mass is the same. Hmm. Oh no, it's not the same. Here you have uh, neutrons also. That's why it is lower. Okay, uh, nitrogen, N2 is 349. Uh, oxygen, O2 is 326. And xenon, which is the heaviest um, noble uh, gas, is 178 meters per second. So yeah, this kind of gives you a, an idea. So this one is um, monoatomic, but really heavy. Uh, it's on average, it has 131.3 nucleons. Okay, so now we can represent or express the gene's length. Actually, we're going to define it this way. So it's going to be the adiabatic index, KBT, divided by 4 pi G, A, number of nucleons, and P, mass of the proton. You know, we are ignoring the mass of the electrons, but that's probably fine. And we're assuming that the mass of the proton and the neutron is the same, but that's also pretty close to reality, definitely within our approximation. Oops. And this is the density. Okay, so we can look at the mass inside uh, 
a diameter of 2 pi rj. So this implies that the radius of this sphere is pi jeans length. So you know, we derived it from our definitions of mass, uh, potential energy, kinetic energy. Jeans originally derived it in a different way. So he was looking at what was the smaller wavelength. Uh, if you have a homogeneous medium, but then you um, you distort it, the smallest uh, wavelength, so like the, the shock wave is propagating, that will um, produce a contraction. So he did it for, uh, with mechanical means, but you know the numbers are the same. Um, again, it's just an approximation. So, so in this in this um little gra uh, this graph, I guess. So if the the amount, well, like if something as light as helium, the speed of sound goes super high. But when there's no particles in the the in the medium that doesn't, there's no sound. So when you go all the way down, does it go approach zero or does it never approach zero? It does. So, um, you know, eventually, just maybe I can just skip that part. We're going to get there in a little bit. So we can express the density, the mass density in terms of the number density. So if mm -hmm. the number density goes down to zero, and this goes to infinity. Um, so it's, it's no matter it's what kind the of like, sound is, huh? It's kind of like a an integral, I guess. Yes. So that's one way to right. see it. So imagine that you have, you know, you, you have your interstellar medium. You grab one particle, and then you say, "Oh, is this enough to you know, bind other particles around it?" No. Okay. What if I grab ten particles? Still no. What if I grab you know, 10 to 25 particles, still no. Uh, what if I grab, you know, 10 to the 40, then yes, you know, you have enough mass in that area to um, collapse the, the, uh, the mass in the region that you're looking at. Wow. If your density is low enough, then you will never, you know, achieve that. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So the, sp um, the speed of sound also depends on the temperature. So if the temperature is lower, the speed of sound is lower. Um, okay, so here the, the genes mass, uh, you know, just do the integral using the same definition as before. And we end up with four pi um, to the fourth over three rho, and then the genes length cube. And when we put the genes length, this one over here, we end up with. Uh, I'm going to skip to the whole thing. And so rho is a mass over volume. So this is gonna be number of nucleons, mass of the proton divided by the volume. So 
this implies that the volume is a and p over rho. And if we take the inverse, one over uh, the volume, which is the number density, that is rho average over a mass of the proton. So then rho is n a and p. So we can put it in here. Um, we end up with genes mass I to the five halves divided by six G to the three halves mass of the proton to the one half. And I put all the constants in here. Um, and this is multiply times the speed of sound cubed divided by N A to the one half. So N is the number density and A is the number of nucleons of the, the particles. So this one over here, this term is equal to 1.31 times 10 to the 29 kilograms. Second cube over meters to the nine halves. You can express this in terms of solar masses if you want. And then over here, you know, we have the CS cube N A to the one half, which do depend on, on the medium. So I just threw in a few values that you know, made sense to me. So using CS equals 600 meters per second. So I thought, you know, this is mostly hydrogen, uh, which has a uh, speed of sound of 1200. There's also some helium in there, which is like, uh, it was like 100 or something. So I thought 600, 600 meters per second was a decent number. Um, for the density, I use 10 to the 10 particles per meter cubed. Um, A, this is mostly. Um, let's say one, you can do 1.2 or something like that. So then I got for this term, uh, 2160, using these values, um, meters to the nine halves per second cubed. And so you know, for this particular medium, the genes mass was uh, 141 solar masses. So if you have a gas club with these properties, then you need 141 solar masses worth of that matter to collapse it into a, you know, eventually into a star. Was, didn't we discuss this like in the gravitational collapse in the first one discussion? The gravel thermal catastrophe? There are a little different, but we're going to, 
Well, actually, so the thing with the with the gravel thermal catastrophe, uh, it mostly works when when the particles are not in contact. So if you have like a cluster of stars, they interact gravitationally, but their, their, their matter, you know, for the most part, um, you know, they don't exchange matter. So we're going to see something, we're going to see the gravel thermal uh, catastrophe again um, when we look at, at uh, galaxies. So if you have a collection of stars, yes, that happens. The difference with this one, with the cloud, is that the matter is in contact. So you have things like, um, like they can transfer um, angular momentum, you know, just by touching each other uh, and the way that stars can exchange orbital momentum if they're not touching is more limited. You also have other effects here like um, turbulence, right, that you cannot have in empty space. So turbulence actually um, yeah, affects what the, uh, the genes mass is going to be. Not the calculated one, but the observed one. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But so once we put in the so remember that the speed of sound was um, a diabetic index kbt over MP A. So we can express the genes mass in terms of these values instead. Um, we end up with something, and this is just algebra. You can look at my notes. Um, it's going to be 4.9. Times ten to the four solar masses divided by meter to the three halves Kelvin to the three halves, and then over here we have a diabetic index temperature to the three halves. A squared, so the number of nucleons, and n to the one half. And this one is cool because we have the temperature in here. So we can see that um, if the temperature is higher, the speed of sound will be higher. The mass that you need to bind the matter is higher. Uh, that makes sense, right? The temperature is related to the kinetic energy, so it's related to the pressure, uh, the thermal pressure. So the genes mass depends on the temperature, the density, and the, uh, the average, well, the, the mass of your particles. That's so cool. It, it's basically like saying how like this, how big the system can be, right? Yeah. Wow. So, I use, um, using this, this equation, um, If you consider 25% helium, 75% um, 
hydrogen, which is still kind of what we have, but definitely what we had right after the, the Big Bang. And you know, consider a temperature of 15,000 Kelvin. So this is kind of describing the early universe, still pretty hot. Most of the particles uh, are going to be monoatomic. So this is still too hot for um, for hydrogen molecules to exist. So most, most of them is going to be five thirds. Uh, A is two times 0 0.25. This is not two, this is, should be four. For helium, so A is one point seventy five. So the average um, mass or the mass per particle with this composition of um, hydrogen and helium. In that case, the gene's mass is going to be about um, one times 10 to the six solar masses. So the first stars, you know, we, we assume that really from this theory, uh, the first stars were really, really massive. They could, smaller stars could not form. Um, so you're not all of these mass ended up in the star. I probably created several uh, stars once it starts collapsing. But you know, this is the initial mass of the cloud. So they did not have uh, metals that you know, we saw last time can cool down the cloud to deliver hot. And that's mostly why the masses had to be so, so big. But if the masses are so big, you know, the, the lifespan of these stars was pretty short, maybe a million years or so. Uh, but after that, you know, they, you know, they exploded uh, into supernovas. And as they were collapsing uh, towards that, you know, with all the nuclear uh, reactions, they created carbon and oxygen and nitrogen that more effectively could cool down these temperatures. So, you know, population three of stars, so the first stars, they were really massive. Uh, they had almost no metal in them, and they had really, really short lives. So the stars that came after that, population two, had some more um, metals, and so the temperatures were smaller, and the stars that were created were smaller. And we can still see some population two stars. Um, you can check the metallicity of the star. And you know, of course, uh, our universe right now is mostly populated by uh, population one stars, like our sun. So the result of you know, two previous generations. Uh, okay, so I, did the same calculation, uh, but using values that are more typical of the universe now. So I use uh, adiabatic index 
seven fifths because why not? It's going to be somewhat less than that, but you can use that. Temperature about you know twenty Kelvin. The universe is pretty cold these days. Uh, density of ten to the twelfth. So you know a little denser because clouds are a little colder these days. So you see those values. I got a jeans mass of 4.7 solar masses. Okay, so nowadays stars the size of our sun are, are favored um, to be created. It's, it will be kind of tough to, it is, it is tough to find uh, really massive stars. Not only because they die very quickly, but also because they are not favored by, um, by this kind of condensation anymore. Okay, uh, let's see. So genes mass is a necessary condition for gravitational condensation, but it is not a sufficient condition. So if you look around with a telescope, you can find uh, clouds that have a mass of about 1,000 solar masses, and they still do not collapse. And you know, there's evidence that they have been, you can look at their composition, there's evidence that they have been around for billions of years, you know, very long time, and they still do not collapse. What do you think that will be? They're too far separated. What's that? They're too far separated. There's gaps in between the, the cloud. There, yeah, there could be some, some gaps, but with a high enough mass, the gaps should be unimportant, right? Because you're just looking at the average density. So uh, high enough mass, it should collapse. Even if it's dark matter, dark matter. Every question, dark matter. I don't know. You know, um, my my guess would be that dark matter is not going to have an effect. So it it it, it produces a gravitational effect. Uh, but it doesn't interact with matter, so it doesn't contribute to the pressure, right, to the kinetic energy. Um, and if it is distributed, you know, um, uniformly, just like a cloud, then it should not have much of an effect. Uh, if you're close to, like, a black hole or something, maybe, but this is just a regular, regular space. Well, the answer is that nobody really knows. So this is a, a current uh, area of research. So the, the leading theories are that turbulence, they're not all the molecules um, are moving in random directions uh, or the atoms, you know, they, they might look a little bit like um, coffee and milk, right, when you, when you mix it. So that contributes to, you know, keep it without collapsing. That's, that's a theory. Um, it's also possible that, it's likely, that the, the magnetic fields are going to have an effect. Um, but nobody knows, you know, exactly why they do not collapse. And there's not really, or I don't think astronomers have found 
um, regions of space in which you know, this is about to happen or happens because our lifetimes are pretty short compared to um, to this phenomenon, the time that it takes. So now let's look at how a cloud like this one might collapse. So we have our box. You're going to have over here, say that initially it's just a uh, uniform. The city is the same everywhere. But then something happens. It can be um, the shock wave produced by a supernova, or it could be, you know, that is passing close to a very heavy star or you know, to an orbiting system. Um, there's a variety of th things that can produce uh, more density in one part of the region than in the rest. So these are you know, kind of random oscillations of, uh, of density. So the genes mass is proportional to the temperature, to the three halves, and to inversely proportional to the density to the one half. So we might imagine, when we're looking at this region, it has a mass M. And because the density increased, the genes mass is right and it's just below the mass of this region. Okay, so that is the beginning of the end. So then it will start um, contracting. You can call it a condensation. But this process is going to take a while because If it starts contracting, what's going to happen to its temperature? It's going to rise. Why? The relationship between um, pressure and temperature and density. So the temperature is going to rise, and then what's going to happen? It's going to move just above the genes mass, right? But then it's gonna cool, it's gonna cool down. Um, it can take a long time, and it's just emitting infrared radiation like we saw um, on Tuesday, if it has some carbon or oxygen molecules in there. So at some point, the temperature is gonna be low enough that the mass is going to be, again, uh, below the genes mass, and then it will start contracting again. So this is going to contract, you know, but only at the rate at which it can radiate um, away this extra energy. Is that why, like, in a binary system, when one star is absorbing another one, the bigger star starts to contract and get smaller? Um, it's related. 
it's not a genes mass, but you know, you you have the uh, the same equations of hydrostatic equilibrium. So yeah, you you have more mass, and typically the the density is going to increase. So the size kind of remains the same, or even gets smaller, depending on what you have, you know, like a brown dwarf or something. Um, so anyways, this for a long time is going to just condense very slowly. So at some point, the temperature is going to be high enough. So the temperature can increase um, you know, as long as the density also increases, right? So it's going to be condensing, the density is going to be increasing, the temperature is going to be uh, increasing as well. So when it becomes uh, hot enough, the kinetic energy is high enough, then hydrogen molecules will start to dissociate. So one hydrogen molecule, molecule becomes two hydrogen atoms. And that releases, uh, that doesn't release, it uh, takes. Four point five uh, electron volts. So the cool thing about this, yeah, so it is, it's paying the price of this uh, Coulomb interaction. So the density can continue decreasing without increasing the temperature because that kinetic energy, instead of you know, becoming um, radiation pressure, well, pressure and, and you have to get rid of it, it's just being used to pay off the debt for the, that Coulomb interaction. So to dissociate. Uh, the temperature will increase, you know, a little. Um, at some point, it will also start ionizing the hydrogen. So H2, uh, sorry, H um, and 13.6 electron volts will create a proton and electron. So it can continue decreasing its density uh, without changing the temperature very much. So it moves really, really slowly. When it has to radiate away the extra temperature, but once it reaches this step, it's almost like a free fall. This is like it is 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 just collapsing on itself. And while it's doing that, it's converting, it's dissociating molecular hydrogen, and then ionizing the hydrogen. And you know eventually. The temperature is going to be high enough that it's going to start uh, fusing hydrogen into into helium. Wow, it's breaking down all the elements that it doesn't need to get its fuel that it needs to kick off nuclear reaction. That's awesome. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's getting rid of the stuff that it doesn't need. It's more like that's what happens, right? And that's kind of why we are here. <laughs> because this happens. The universe works in mysterious ways. It does. So, you know, you can probably imagine this in your in your mind, right? You have your medium low, and then it just collapses into a star. Then, you know, once it starts nuclear uh, fusion, then the lighter elements are just going to um, be removed by the with the radiation, um, the stellar, the solar wind in, in this case, and it creates that that bubble like like the sun does, 
So it carves out uh, its, own, its own environment. So how quickly does this happen? So we can get it just from a free fall. So if we have a mass, you know, dm, and the kinetic energy is going to be converting to potential. So on this side, we're going to have g m of r zero. Em, uh, sorry, delta m over r uh, minus, I'm going to put here, so this is a test mass. Um, at this point, you can imagine, you know, a spherical symmetry. This is got the proto star, and you want to know how long it will take for uh, that test mass to just collapse into a single point. Well, actually, the whole thing. So you know, if, if you're farther away, then it's going to move faster. You know, there's more mass to attract it, uh, but there's a longer way to to go than you know, if you're in the middle or if you're very close to the center. So kind of everything will collapse you know, at the same time. So you can get rid of the DMs, the delta Ms, have them everywhere. Uh, this velocity squared is the RDT. Um, can rewrite this, that is 1 over r minus 1 over capital R. And the 2, we can put it over here. And then we have the r over here, we can take Um, oops. Square root, so to the one half, and then we can move this whole thing over here. So it'll be two gm or not one minus r over one minus over r not. to the negative one half. Dr equals dt. So if we integrate on both sides, we can get an effective time of how long it will take to collapse. It goes from zero to R0. So this equation becomes pi over 32g uh, oh. yeah well to the one half so I used the definition of the genes mass uh, when we had the, the row to get that row is pi to the five halves CS cubed six G to the three halves and J. 
and I want to know, um, you know, how long it will take for a protostar with the mass of the sun to collapse. So this would be solar mass, one solar mass. And for CS, I use just, just for kicks, uh, 200 meters per second. So then the density is uh, 5.2 times 10 to the negative 15 kilograms per meter cube. And everything else is a constant now. Um, also here, rho is really the only thing that, that matters. It only depends on the density. So I got uh, T effective equals 29,000 years. So you, know, you have your uh, interstellar medium slowly contracting, you know, once you reach the genus mass in some region of space. Um, for a very long time, it could be, you know, hundreds of millions of years. Uh, and then it starts to convert or to dissociate uh, molecular hydrogen. And from that point, it takes about 29,000 years to condense everything to one point. So essentially to, this is the upper limit on the creation of as uh, a star like the sun. So, you know, pretty quickly, if you ask me. Would that be the end of its first um, like life cycle in some way? Mm, well, like becoming a adult, I guess, an adult star. Yeah, yeah, it will go into the main sequence. So after this. And then, you know, depending on the initial mass, like something like the sun, uh, a star like the sun, it you know, just lives for about 10 billion years in the main sequence. Uh, then becomes a red giant, um, gets rid of, it, the matter is going to have some momentum. So it's going to let you know, this cloud, the external cloud, go out and the core is going to form um, white dwarf. So it's going to contribute a little bit to the enriching of, of the universe with metals, not as much as the heavier stars, but still. And yeah, you know, maybe maybe that external layer that is going to be freed by our sun you know can produce another cloud to collapse and form another star that's more difficult to predict i think but you know it is a, it is a cycle of birth and death I guess. But there is, there is a direction. The direction is towards smaller and smaller uh, stars because there's more metal. So, you know, probably in the very far future, um, you're going to have only like red dwarves. 
we can live off we can live off the gravitational um collapsing of gas giants on the moons of them yeah pretty much all right so that's what i have for you today um any questions or comments if not i heard something no, I have no comments. Okay. Uh, we're going to look at uh, accretion disks. Um, I guess accretion and accretion disks next time. Okay. Understood. Okay. See you on Tuesday then. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a good night. Bye. Have a good night. Good night, everybody. Mm-hmm.